got a little funny on my phone. You ever took a job and or a, a new job and, and people want to compare you to the person you're replacing and can say, well, they did a better job or whatever. This is a little funny about two pastors. It said the previous pastor had been a paragon of virtue. He lived up to all the people's expectations. He loved to work around the church and kept both the church house and the grounds in pristine condition. Remember when pastors used to live in um, the house next to the church? I can't even think of the word I'm looking for. Parsonage. Parsonage. But the new pastor wasn't that type. He hired someone to do a lot of these chores, including the mowing of the lawn. Naturally, this cost the church more money. This change of pattern was of concern to some of the elders of the church. One of them one day approached the new pastor and tried to bring this up tactfully. He said to the new pastor, you know, the previous pastor mowed the lawn himself. Have you considered this approach? And the new pastor came back and said, yes, I'm aware of this. I asked him to, but he doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> This morning we're going to talk about adoption. Adoption. Think about that. The concept of adoption. Uh, when you see little children that don't have um, a, a, a natural family and they get adopted into a new family. We saw in the news a couple of weeks ago there was a little boy, I think he was about 11 years old. He had been in 25 foster homes in the last four years. And a family finally adopted them. And they were all sitting around on the news, uh, about eight of them in this family, and they all had shirts on and said, the chosen one. And this little boy was so happy to, it, to finally have a forever home as he called it. At the end of the service, we'll have the Lord's Supper in conjunction with the sermon title, Chosen by Adoption. Here's one definition of adoption that I saw not too long ago. It said this, it means I grew in my mommy's heart instead of her stomach. Think about that. I grew in my mommy's heart instead of her stomach. Well, today we're going to see how we must have grew in God's heart because he chose to adopt us. So look with me in your summer notes at Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14. This is some of my favorite scripture in the whole all of the Bible. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession 
to the praise of his glory. Again, that's some of my favorite scripture. We're actually going to read this again towards the end of my message in a different version. version. But I want to share with you something. I probably shared this with you once before, I think. But, but this was, you'll wonder why is he talking about this, but it leads up to the explanation of adoption so well. Several years ago, we laid to rest our 40th president of the United States of America. Ronald Reagan was a gracious man who led this country for eight years after having been the governor of the state of California uh, after a long career as a Hollywood movie star. Now, I don't remember, I'm not old enough to remember when he was a movie star, but some of you may well do so. But many of us sat and watched the funeral services on, te on television that literally spanned the entire day because uh, it began in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and then it culminated later in the afternoon in his home state of California where he was buried. But there were many good things that were said about President Reagan uh, 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 by many people on that day, and several mentioned his faith in the Lord as his Savior. Now, I'm not sure what denomination that he was, and I'm not sure if he was truly born again or not, but others that knew him claimed that he was, and that's all we can go by. It stirred my heart when our then current president, George W. Bush, of whom I firmly believe is a born-again Christian, stood and spoke these words about one of his predecessors. He said that Ronald Reagan was in heaven and finally able to see his Savior face to face. And I thought, wow, what, what an awesome thought. For those of us who are truly saved, that, that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, that have sought the forgiveness of our sins and trusted in Christ as our Savior, the Bible clearly states that there will come a day that we will go to heaven and see our Savior face to face. And we know this to be a reality. We have faith that we will see our Jesus one day, and yet that faith is real. There's no doubt whatsoever if you truly know Christ as your Savior. Uh, our Father in Heaven has promised us this, and He doesn't lie. So let me ask you this morning, do you look forward to that day when we will see our Savior face to face? Now you've heard me say many times before that it's not our job to judge whether others are saved or not. That's between them and the Lord. And yet you have to wonder, and it's just natural, to be curious, especially if and when you see a funeral that has a lot of religious, a lot of religious rituals as part of the service. Now there's nothing wrong with religion or religious rituals as long as it is coupled with or centered around a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, religion is okay, but it's not okay if that, is, if that alone is what you're counting on to get you to heaven. Uh, Jesus and Jesus alone is the only way to be saved from our sins and the due penalty of our sins. But at the time, this was the first state funeral for president in 30 years, so I, I just, I remember, I think it was a Saturday, I, I just thought I would watch it and see what it was about, and it was interesting for me to observe what all that took place, and I wasn't sure if it was in this big, huge cathedral to accommodate the crowd, or if maybe the family had chosen it, but there was obviously a little bit of mixture of several denominations or religions in the ceremony. Uh, in some cases, or should I say in many cases, the pursuit of religion or relig religious ritualistic traditions passed down from many generations can get us off track from the true gospel of Jesus Christ if we're not careful. And the fact that only by faith in Him can a man be saved and on his way to heaven. After the fact, after they die, it's too late. It's too late to pray for the soul. Catholics believe, uh, Catholics believe that when someone dies, you get together and you pray for their soul. Well, it's too late at that time. That person determined their own faith, whether they trusted in Christ or did not trust in Christ as their Savior before they died. What about you? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? 
Are you counting on Him and Him alone and what He did for you on Calvary's cross to save you from your sins and to give you eternal life? Or are you one that has been confused and been wrapped up in some religious expectations? Again, at the end of the service, we're going to have communion. And we want to make sure today that you are truly saved, that there's come a time in your life that you trusted in Christ as your personal Savior. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So only by trusting in Christ and not religion or, rel or rituals or anything else can mankind be saved. I remember several years ago at our ministers meeting, uh, we sat and heard from a church planner from the state of Utah. And you know, in Utah, most of the people that live in Utah, not all, but a, a, a high percentage of the people that live in Utah are Mormons. And we heard this church planner who was trying to church Southern by, plant Southern Baptist churches there talk about the counterfeit religion of Mormonism. Uh, this cult that is so falsely wrapped up in the name of Jesus Christ. Like they call themselves uh, Latter-day Saints of the Latter-day Latter -day Saints of Jesus Christ. Uh, but you just have to know uh, the right, the, the truth that they're not teaching. They, they will agree with you and me on much about Jesus and make you think that they believe in the same basic doctrines that we do until you ask the right questions. And then you will realize that they worship a false Jesus. You just have to know the right questions to ask. Uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses both will say that Jesus is the Son of God, but they deny that He is God. And we as, as true Christians, as Baptists, we believe that in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they deny that Jesus is God. They just say that He's the Son of God, but then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that they throw in that's not true. But back to the figure of Ronald Reagan, as awesome as it was for me to sit and hear our then current president talk about this deceased one being face to face with this Savior, uh, there was something else that really stirred my heart later that evening when the body and the family had arrived in California. There was a long gap between that morning and that afternoon because they were flying to California. And I remember thinking Nancy Reagan, who was up in years, his wife must have been completely worn out after all those hours. But when they got to California, Ronald Reagan's three surviving children stood and said a few words about their dad. And the words were moving and stirring, to say the least, as Michael Reagan, and then daughter Patty, and then Ron Jr., and each one of them, as you can imagine, had wonderful things to say about their father and their childhood. But the first one to stand, the oldest son from a previous marriage, was Michael Reagan, who happened to be adopted. And these words from this adopted son really stirred my heart as I sat and thought about the fact that we too, if we are saved, are adopted by our Heavenly Father. If we are true believers, we are adopted into the family of God and we are royalty. We are kingdom kids. This young man who had been adopted as a baby by Ronald Reagan stood and talked about how much his father loved him and accepted him as his very own. It didn't matter that the other two children were natural children. They were all three the children of Ronald Reagan. They were equal. And then he made this statement regarding his dad. He said, my father never mentioned to me, never once, or even behind my back, that I was adopted. I was his son. It was so special to hear these words from this adopted one. And I immediately thought about my Heavenly Father of whom I have been adopted. And chills ran up and down my back as I thought about the truth and the reality of how my Father thinks of me and how He also thinks of you. If you too have been adopted by trusting in Christ as your personal Savior, He never reminds me or you or throws it up in our face that we're adopted. 
He doesn't remind us of where we came from, just a sinner saved by grace. He doesn't discourage us with petty, petty little issues like where we would be if he hadn't have adopted us. I am his son. Just like Jesus, I am his son. And this morning when we have communion, we're going to look back and reflect back to what Jesus did upon the cross to make all of this possible. For us to be adopted into the family of God. Uh, according to God's precious word the Bible, we too are adopted. And our adoption is a spiritual one that takes place the moment that we seek the forgiveness of our sins and ask Jesus to come into our lives and to save us and give us eternal life. Again, what about you? Have you been adopted into the family of God? Not just church or religion, but do you have a personal relationship with your adopted Heavenly Father? Have you trusted in Christ? When we do this, we are adopted into the family of God. We become royalty instantly, just like Michael Reagan was adopted into Ronald Reagan's family, who later became the President of the United States. Well, that's how we are adopted by our Heavenly Father, God Almighty. God Almighty becomes our Father in heaven. And yet He looks at us just like He looks at His natural Son, Jesus Christ. We're no different in His eyes because we've inherited the very righteousness of Christ. And we are instantly indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to listen to this scripture again, Ephesians 1, 3-14. I'm going to read this in a, paraphr uh, a paraphrase called the message. The message is not a direct translation of the Bible, but it's a paraphrase, kind of like the living Bible. And it says this, How blessed is God, and what a blessing He is. He's the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long before He laid down the earth's foundations, He had us in mind had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, His blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans He took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in Him everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ, we got our hopes up. He had His eyes on us and designed for on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose He is working out in everything and everyone. It is in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, the message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder of that will get everything God has planned for us a praising and glorious life. I love that scripture. What an awesome passage of scripture written by the Apostle Paul under the direction of the Holy Spirit of, of God. In detail, he describes our adoption into the family of God. He chose us before the creation of the world to become holy and blameless. And, and this we can only do through Christ and His righteousness. It's, there's no other way you can't attain any of this uh, in our own strength. Christ came and 
laid down his life upon the cross to take away our sins. In verse 7 it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. This is how we are adopted in all of this in love. Uh, without the redemption, this redemption, then we could not be adopted into the family of God because of our sin. Verses 13 and 14 again says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of of those who are God's possession, the praise of His glory. We were saved and included in this family when we first heard and believed in the gospel of our salvation. When we trusted in Christ, we were adopted and promised eternal life and promised abundant life. And at that very moment, we were indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance one day when we get to heaven. You know, when a, a child is adopted into a family, they then become eligible to get a part of their parents' inheritance. Uh, just like a natural child, they receive their fair share. Uh, so it is with those of us who have been adopted into the family of God through the redemption of our sins and our cleansing by His precious Son's blood. Not only do we inherit just eternal life, but as joint heirs with Christ, we share in everything with Him. And this is this is huge. This is nothing to stuff about. Uh, the Bible says that we are joint heirs with Christ. We share in His righteousness and His holiness and in His kingdom and in everything else, His inheritance, co-heirs. Just as Jesus is the only begotten Son of God as a result of uh, of our adoption, we too are children of God. When our Heavenly Father looks down on you, at you and me, if we are born again, He sees us just like Jesus. After all, we are clothed in His righteousness. And this is what makes us eligible to partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is what makes us eligible to go to heaven one day. Without this, we're not eligible. Uh, now these are some strong statements that I'm saying this morning that we're on equal status with Jesus but I believe this is what the Word of God teaches us in regard to our adoption. We are joint heirs. Look at Romans 8, 17. It says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. We are so special because we have been chosen for adoption. We've been chosen by the King of Kings. When I was a youth pastor back in the 90s, I had a little girl in my youth group that was adopted. And I remember her dad telling me one day, he said, Crystal came home from school and said the other kids were making fun of her. Uh, making fun of her because she was they found out she was adopted and he says I told her to go back and tell those kids that their parents are stuck with them but that you were chosen I'll never forget that she was chosen Michael Reagan stood beside the casket of his father President Ronald Reagan and he said I was the chosen one I was the chosen one they stood there side by side Michael, Patty and Ron completely on even status. It didn't matter that two were natural and one was adopted. They were equally loved and accepted and respected. And that's how it is when we stand by Jesus, or rather, should I say, He stands by us, undeservingly and unmerited. We are equally the children of God. Because in love we were chosen for adoption. One more verse of scripture. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Isn't that good news this morning? At the end of Ronald Reagan's funeral, 
And they said this, they said, I now begin the journey into the sunset of my life. Well done, my faithful servant. Well done, my son. But I just thought that was just a, a perfect way to compare our adoption as children of God into, into royalty. More so than even the President of the United States. We belong to the King of Kings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time looking into your precious word this morning. We thank you most of all that Jesus came and laid down his life, that we might have life, that we might be adopted into your family, that we might become children of God, a joint heirs with Christ. And Lord, we just thank you so much for this truth and thank you for the reality of what this means. Lord, we just thank you uh, this morning that we can look into the precious Word of God and see this truth and experience this truth and feel this truth because it's real. And Father, we just pray now as we have our invitation for Your will to be done and then afterwards, Lord, we're going to have communion. We're going to celebrate around the Lord's table and look back to what Jesus did for us that we might be adopted into Your family. We just thank You and love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our invitation hymn is hymn number 483, which stand with me and we'll sing Footsteps of Jesus.